All right, good evening, everybody. Let's, uh, let's get started. <coughs> so it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the eighth annual John and Cynthia Schultz Lecture in Energy. Uh, as that title would imply, this is the eighth uh, year that we've done this. And uh, I think each year we're, we're gaining momentum. And uh, this year we have a very special speaker to talk about energy policy uh, here in Colorado. Um, before uh, I introduce Dean um, Weiser, who will introduce our lecturer, I did want to just point out that out in the lobby, we have copies of the center's new newsletter. Uh, so please get a copy of that if you didn't see it. It's got all sorts of information about what the Getches Wilkinson Center is up to these days, what the faculty is up to, uh, what are some of our upcoming events are. Uh, so it's a, I think it's a very good introduction for uh, what we're trying to do. Um, I'd also like very much to thank members of the Schultz and the Howard family who are here with us uh, today for their generous support of this lecture and of the center and the school. So on behalf of the faculty and the staff and the whole center, thank you very much. So. And with that, I will introduce uh, Dean Phil Weiser. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our governor and provide a little opening flavor. So first, the flavor for John Schultz is um, like the most unbelievably nourishing and um, fulfilling meal you can imagine. John has served up for this law school, not just this lectureship, not just a classroom, not just a scholarship, but also our loan repayment assistance program. Um, he has been the largest benefactor in the current campaign that we're in, and we're so um, honored by his leadership. And for those Schultz scholars in the room or people who benefit from loan repayment assistance, um, you have someone to thank in the reception afterwards. <laughs> We have two giants who the center is named after, Charles Wilkinson, who I believe is somewhere here and about, and David Getchis, um, and Anne um, is sitting with us here. The vision and spirit and ambition of David and Charles have long loomed large and guided Colorado law as we have led in the area of natural resources, energy, and the environment. For those who don't know about their legacies, um, David, who passed away right as I was assuming the deanship, there's a um, wonderful um, John Fielder exhibit right outside honoring his leadership. And uh, for those who want to hear more about Charles, come to our March um, Winter Symposium, March 10th and 11th, to hear about his leadership, um, which is nothing short of uh, transformational. We have a lot of the members of the Advisory Council of the Getches Wilkins Center here today. I can't name them all but I thank you all for your leadership. And for those um, joining afterwards in the reception, a great tradition is to encourage mixing among different folks. For the question and answer period, I will have a couple students give the first question, and I will not hesitate to call on people if I have to. And if you've worked for the governor over a summer, you know that you're particularly on the hook for being called on, so you can start taking your questions now. So that brings us to our featured speaker who is um, our nation's most entrepreneurial governor, um, our nation's uh, leader in oil and gas policies, someone whose commitment to finding strategies for natural resources protection, environmental preservation, is creative, thoughtful, and paving the way for the U.S. Um, I literally can't say enough good things about his leadership and the friend he's been to Colorado Law not just hiring our students, but he was our graduation speaker and is an inspiration. Um, he is not a lawyer by trade, but he's now worked with enough lawyers that um, he really knows his way around law and regulation. And without any further ado, let me welcome John Hickmuthis. Thank you for the, the kind listening here. If I just talk like that, can you hear it? 
or should I lean down into it? Um, I appreciate uh, all of you being here, but I especially appreciate all that Phil Weiser has done for this school. And I think his ability to reshape in, in, in subtle but very, very important ways the, the, the vision of this law school has been very, very powerful. And I think it is now, I think without question, one of the most entrepreneurial driven. And I don't mean just preparing lawyers to work for entrepreneurs, but al allowing lawyers to come out with a, a, a self-image of themselves as entrepreneurs in terms of crafting a career and looking at how they're going to go forth in the world. And that is a huge gift, not just to Colorado, but to our country. So we will give you an applause for all your hard work. Uh, I also appreciate uh, Cynthia John Schultz for, for doing this. You know, I, when you're younger, you, it's, a, it's a real sign of getting old when you recognize and really begin to appreciate how different people give back and, and, and really reaching out and saying, all right, I want to be, you know, to create a context by which information, valuable information, gets transferred to the people where they can do the most good. And I think that's, when I think of, of my, should I end up with that much money, which I'm not sure I will, but you never can tell. Um, <laughs> I think that's something that I would, you know, doing some sort of a lecture series or figuring out some way to endow the opportunity to create that platform by which people connect around valuable information is, is uh, incredibly valuable. Uh, now, in thinking about this lecture and contemplating the, the sheer scope of what energy means to the world, I briefly considered changing the title of this speech to Energy, We're Screwed. Um, <laughs> It's, it's daunting when you look at, at what we're up against. Uh, accelerating energy demand globally, uh, antiquated infrastructure, uh, and the long periods of time it takes to scale promising, but in most cases unproven technologies to a global market. Uh, not to mention a, a little thing like climate change. Uh, you know, many of today's Thought leaders view climate change as one of the most urgent crises facing humanity. Uh, the Pope, no, no one less than the Pope, recently delivered an impassioned plea uh, for, for politicians and, and economics to enter into a frank dialogue to discuss it. Uh, Bill Gates has called for a tripling of government R&D to, to over $18 billion a year strictly around energy, to catalyze a global energy transformation to take us beyond fossil fuels. Amory Lovins, a, a true visionary, a prominent voice for many decades in the field of energy, ha has spent the last 40 years advocating that we pursue a cleaner, more efficient path to new forms and new systems of power. So, I mean, whatever opinions you might have about climate change and the need or, or lack thereof to address it, forging a cleaner, more efficient global energy system isn't just about the environment. It's, it's got serious implications across the board, uh, economic, uh, social, national security, public health, uh, to, in, to ensure the kinds of of transformation that Gates, Lovins, and even the Pope are talking about. We need a new energy system that, and I think of it these three basic components. It should be cheaper and more efficient than today's hydrocarbon sources. It should have none, or let's say limited, or no carbon emissions. And it should be as reliable as today's energy system. Sounds relatively simple, right? Uh, actually, it's, it would be a miracle to have that, right? Something that's as cheap as what we have today, that's, that's absolutely clean, and that is as reliable as we have today, it would be a miracle. But it's, it's a miracle that we're going to create. And I don't have any doubt about that. It's a miracle we have to create. Uh, we need to, to scale and deliver. Uh, these types of new systems uh, to a world that is demanding an unprecedented amount, an unprecedented amount of new energy. Uh, over the next 
25 years, some two and a half to three billion people in China and India and Brazil and Indonesia, other developing countries are going to rise into the ranks of the middle class. And they will require a huge surge in the energy supply to support their growth and their new standards of living. There's no two closer connections between a rising out of poverty than energy and education. And most people say you need energy to be able to get to the education. Global energy consumption is going to be projected but to increase by, by more than 56% by 2040. And that's not just change, that's, that's what we old geologists call tectonic change. Uh, to, bo to borrow a phrase from my former Facebook relationship status, it's complicated. Um, <laughs> we know we can't change our current system overnight, but every single industry is going to have a role to play in its transformation. Uh, the U.S. oil and gas industry is currently facing its worst downturn in, in six years, um, but, but we shouldn't let that take us away from the fact that due to innovation and investment in, in research and development over the past 12 or 15 years, we're getting resources out of the ground cleaner and more efficiently, uh, changing the face of the industry through the use of 3D seismic imaging, uh, doing long horizontal wells up to three miles with hydraulic fracturing, and, and getting rig costs down to literally a third less than what they were a year ago. And thanks to the to those advances in technology that allow us to access resources that previously were thought to be unattainable, we're on a track in this country to be a net exporter of natural gas, which was unfathomable just 10 years ago. Uh, you look at the potential of natural gas that we have now and that the, the projections that the consistent low price allows us to really aggressively use it to replace coal that didn't exist 10 years ago. We have an opportunity to partner with Canada and Mexico to develop oil and gas resources and make uh, North America uh, a major center, not just for production, but also for exports. Now, from an in in industry perspective, that sounds very promising. But when you think about our long-term energy goals, it doesn't do a lot for climate change, right? Certainly, replacing coal with natural gas is a giant step, but looking at that miracle, it, it doesn't deliver us. When you, when you think about those long-term goals, seizing opportunities like these new technologies and hydrocarbons is a lot like playing with a, a Rubik's Cube. Every move you make to solve the puzzle also brings a new set of complications and, and setbacks. Now, you can take natural gas. A recent Yale University study found that the single largest contributor to the significant reduction of U.S. CO2 emissions between 2008 and 2013 was the transition from coal to natural gas for electric, electrical generation. And natural gas emits far less carbon than coal, but it still contributes significantly to climate change. Uh, and many question uh, the failure to address all the pitfalls of using it as a as a bridge fuel. Um, certainly the, the issues around the waste, the, the escaping, the fusion of emissions, but the escaping emissions from the, the production of natural gas has been very concerning to pretty much all of us that look closely at energy. Uh, here in Colorado, we've already addressed that, uh, or made a giant step in addressing that issue around fugitive emissions. Uh, we convened experts from the environmental community, uh, from the oil and gas industry for really almost a year. We basically got the, the Environmental Defense Fund and several industry leaders to provide experts and we locked them in a, in a sealed room, anaerobically sterile. Um, but we, that's an exaggeration, but we, they spent a good 11 months, first several months just agreeing on definitions of terms and, and, and what the research really did say and then moving from that, those agreements and compromises, because you can imagine it was full of compromise, to really create the first set of methane regulations in the United States. And when we announced those regulations, we had the leaders of 
both Colorado and national environmental groups standing side by side with the senior executives of some of the largest uh, oil and gas companies, both of them describing this as, as, a, as a great windfall and a great benefit and something that they were, they were both, all, that everybody was proud of. I think this kind of, of collaborative success needs to be emulated again and again. We can wait for a miracle, but hard work and, and collaboration uh, again and again are, are what allow us to, to create an energy miracle. When we look to uh, renewable energy resources like wind and solar, we find they're neither as costly as they once were or as, or as some would have us believe, but, but they're also not as easy to adopt on a global scale as some others might claim. Uh, certainly in some places, uh, solar power is scaling even faster than cell phones. China is currently the largest renewables market in the world, uh, but they also have the world's worst air quality, so that shouldn't be a huge surprise. Uh, having spent f uh, four and a half days there uh, last month, I, I fully expect that they will be, continue to be the leader in solar and wind because their people are demanding it, and everyone we talked to was aware of it and, and ma making sure that their opinion was known. I think America's reliance on renewable energy has reached historic levels, but it, it needs to go further and it's poised to go further. Uh, we've dramatically increased our renewable energy here in Colorado since 2004 uh, when we had the first voter-approved uh, renewable energy standard. Uh, back in 2004, rough justice, 1 percent of our total electricity came from renewable sources, uh, and now in 2014 that, that percentage is up to 15 percent. Uh, by 20, 2020, uh, our largest utility uh, will draw 30 percent of its power from clean and renewable sources. Uh, but, but the major challenges with wind and solar are, are obvious and, and well known, intermittency uh, and storage. We can't control when the wind blows, uh, when the sun shines, or storage-wise, we have yet to develop a cost-efficient battery or some other method like compressed air or hot metals or <coughs> pumping water uphill that can provide grid-scale economic storage. Uh, meanwhile, we derive just below 20 percent of America's total electrical generation from nuclear power. And while nuclear is a non-carbon, uh, non-CO2 uh, energy source, it doesn't, it doesn't have these fugitive emissions, the issues around cost, the safety and security of waste disposal, uh, and our zero risk tolerance for accidents uh, have made nuclear energy for, for many, even at least within the present technology, unrealistic in a, in a drive for a new viable system. Not to say that the miracle couldn't come from there, but, but that has not appeared yet. So given this, this complex Rubik's Cube of, of potential solutions and, and consequent complications, how do we piece together that right combination of, of moves to generate the cleaner, cheaper, more efficient and reliable energy sources that we need? How do we piece together the right, uh, the right way to, the right places to derive energy from? Uh, how are we going to deliver it? Uh, how are we going to facilitate the, the, the monumental changes that are going to be necessary, given that, you know, historically energy transitions don't move nearly as quickly as the digital innovations we've become accustomed to? It's hard to imagine a disruptive innovation, uh, but all the more reason why we should work for that innovation. All this brings us to that, to what I call the entrepreneurial perspective, um, and I think there are threats and also opportunities in pretty much all the moves that we can make, whatever we contemplate, but the, the common denominator uh, in every solution is, is that sense of innovation, innovation and collaboration. Every one of these challenges is an, in, is an opportunity to innovate, uh, deploying existing technologies more strategically as in, say, demand-side management, and empowering breakthroughs to the next big thing in energy development through innovation, uh, they would give us the chance to leverage the real driving force, the real scalable drive, which is the market, by offering solutions that aren't just better for the environment or, or, or help us mitigate climate change, 
but will be more affordable, more reliable, more effective and cleaner than today's energy. As a, as a business person and now a public servant, you know, I look at the promoting the energy sector innovation and, and at the same time trying to anticipate how to leverage market forces as both a, a public and a private endeavor. Affordable, reliable energy is a, is a public good. It's in our best interest to support innovation every place we can, uh, make sure that we have smart regulatory infrastructure and, and much more investment in research and development. Uh, I think that's why Bill Gates is championing, championing this, this quest to dramatically incre increase R&D in this country. Uh, in his words, to drive innovation at an unnaturally high pace. Uh, as Gates suggests, governments can do more to stimulate innovation by dramatically increasing spending on R&D than by any other method. Uh, he also points out that some complain that government does things so poorly. Well, one thing government does very, very well is research and development, but, but especially research. And you compare that when you look at the, the success for venture capital investments, if you look in the technology sector or any sector, uh, the, the failure of the private sector to accurately predict which companies is going to succeed, I mean, we don't even think about it. We accept it as a given. Uh, I think government has a higher, much higher success ratio with their research in terms of really finding and focusing on those things that, that will succeed and make a difference. Um, as we facilitate regulatory change to both protect our environment, uh, to guarantee public health, uh, we're going to support initiatives like the Clean Power Plan. I suspect I'll get a question on the Clean Power Plan after this. Uh, not to mention fuel efficiency standards, uh, both in transportation and in, in building. Uh, the private sector, in turn, really has to lead the creation and deployment, the, the, the development of new technologies that come out of research. Uh, and, and in that way, it can be scaled uh, rapidly, not just throughout the U.S., but in developing com countries and, and all countries around the world. Uh, ultimately, we won't change these immense systems because it's the right thing to do. I mean, that's a pretty subjective notion. Uh, we're going to change because innovation and new technology drive the market. And that, and that market is, is what really will drive the change. You know, go back to the mid-1800s um, when, when Benjamin Silliman first figured out how to crack crude oil and, and, and create kerosene, uh, which took a number of years. But once, once they figured it out, it revolutionized the energy system, which until then had, you know, almost completely relied on whale oil. There's a whole industry, giant infrastructure built around the, the, the development and the delivery of whale oil. And as kerosene changed the face of energy, the whaling industry declined almost overnight, uh, not because of public awareness of the evils of whaling, not because of the consciousness-raising efforts by, you know, early environmentalists, and certainly not because of legislation. The whales were saved because of the march of technology and because there was something that was dramatically better. Uh, you could call it, and, and many people then did call it, a miracle. Now, we're already seeing amazing progress being made in new technologies. Uh, around energy development, I could talk for an hour on this. Uh, paved gin flooring tiles convert high footfall areas, places with a lot of pedestrian traffic, into pseudo batteries that can be used to power city lights. Uh, the Japanese Space Agency is working to develop technologies to transmit electricity wirelessly. Uh, and their goal is to be able to transmit energy from orbiting solar panels by 2030. Um, Goodyear has unveiled a new concept tire that will potentially generate electricity for electric cars by converting the frictional heat that's created when the rubber, quote unquote, meets the road. That's the kind of stuff that our future's made of. And I think, you know, that miracle is, is probably not one of those, but probably something that, that people are in some garage or, or some basement just now thinking of. That's a, the kind of innovation that, that should get every entrepreneur's pulse quickening. Uh, I mean, we're, 
we're here today and, and we're in this situation because the human species is without question the single most adaptable species on the planet. Now, I would leave out the insect world for that. Um, but we've innovated our, our way to the moon and beyond. Uh, and I am, you know, call me a crazy optimist, but I am confident that we're going to be able to, to meet the energy challenges. Uh, but only if we can keep that focus on, on, on meeting each threat as an opportunity to encourage and, and to encourage and support our collective ingenuity uh, and, and to make sure that we harness and uh, those efforts that, that really encourage public-private collaboration uh, that, that can bring around this process. Uh, it's funny when you think about it, and I, one of my staff pointed this out, you can't spell innovate without N-O. And no is the word that entrepreneurs and visionaries use to, uh, well, they use as fuel for the, the unprecedented, the unthinkable, the impossible. Most entrepreneurs, when they hear someone say no, they, they often don't show it on their face, but they're smiling. And they're just saying, oh, yeah? You don't have to be a scientist or a billionaire to solve the energy puzzle, although I would guess you're probably going to need some engineers and scientists around you. Uh, I think anybody can take an entrepreneurial challenge this, and I think some unique way of, of bringing the right ideas together in the right context. I think the key is that we just, that we don't back down. Uh, Sheryl Sandberg said, we lean in. Uh, even when, well, when, when you think we might be screwed, uh, actually especially when you think we might be screwed, uh, that's when the, the big ideas and, and the real breakthroughs uh, really happen. So, thank you. So we have time in Colorado Law fashion for some question, answer, discussion, starting with our students. I will give an opportunity for volunteers before I evoke uh, the professorial prerogative of calling on people. So. All right, right in the back. Thank you, Governor. I'm curious what your thoughts are on um, the concept of uh, um, some environmental leaders have talked about how no matter what technologies we develop, um, we're going to need crash conservation. And I'm curious what your thoughts are in terms of that balance. Um, regardless of the new technology, do we need, you know, massive crash conservation in terms of energy and resource usage as well? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, I was, <coughs> I was reading um, one of my mother's great aunts and great uncle were on the Titanic. And the, the husband went down with the ship, but the wife was in a, la in a lifeboat it ended up having about 65 people in it. It was meant for 24 people, I think, and, and it was taking on water. So even as they knew they had to go to get to the, was it the Lusitania? I can't remember. But they had to bail nonstop, right? So even though they knew that bailing wasn't going to be the solution, they knew that they, even as they paddled, and even as they knew the Lusitania was coming, it, it took them, I think it was 16 hours or 18 hours to get there, and they kind of knew the right direction, but they were bailing all the time, and I think that's, we're going to need to do everything at once because we just don't know when that miracle is going to happen. Right? We, I mean, we, I, we're going to have in the next few years major pushes on energy efficiency and crafting. I mean, everything. Everything at once. All right, I think another student question. Let's go. I can project in the. We've got the live stream, so we want to make sure everyone. So the people behind you won't be able to hear. I've got a loud voice. Um, hi, I'm Andrea Matuel. Um, I wanted to ask you about the clean power plan, so you read my mind. <laughs> um, I know it tasked Colorado with some pretty aggressive goals and achieving pretty significant reductions in greenhouse gases from coal plants. And Senator McConnell was kind enough to extend an invitation for you to just say no, which I know you can't spell innovation without now. Um, 
<laughs> and I wanted to see if you, you declined his invitation, and I wanted to see if you could speak to that and give us a bit of uh, Colorado's goals and how we are going to achieve that. Sure. So Colorado, and I, you know, I generally try to avoid getting into the debate about climate change. I, I, for the life of me, I personally can't imagine how you can look at the data and not see that the climate is changing. But there have been a lot of miscorrelations and, and wrong presentations, and there's just a lot of doubt out there. So I generally try, try to avoid it. But regardless of climate change, Colorado is in that position where, you know, pretty much every part of the state, not all of it, but, you know, 80 percent of our, of our state is a mile high or higher. So pollution in our air has a much higher effect on our, on our bodies, on our families, our bodies, our families, our, our community. We had the, the, the bar that, that 111D sets for us is a high bar, but we've already been working on this for a while. Uh, we have the added benefit in Colorado that our identity, our brand to the rest of the world is this incredibly beautiful place with majestic mountains and outdoor recreation. Well, if we put our shoulder to it and, and really clean our air, that does nothing but help our brand, not to mention making all of our citizens healthier. So for, for, for my office, it was, it didn't, literally, we didn't spend more than 10 minutes when, when Senator McConnell, who I respect on, on some places, <laughs> that didn't come out right. Um, <laughs> but, but I think that, that in this case, he, he was missing, not seeing the forest from the trees. And I think that the, uh, as a country, we're going to continually get cleaner and safer and always have. And the way to do that is setting rigorous goals through regulatory frameworks that force us collectively to go faster and higher than we would otherwise. Uh, and it did give me a certain pleasure to write the letter back saying that not only were we already at work on this, but we were going to do it, and we would do it ahead of schedule. Uh, and we will. I mean, we're already looking at wh what, are the, what are the choices. Uh, well, our real goal, and we're going uh, we're to do this come, come hell or high water, but our goal is to be able to get to those clean air goals without increasing our, our, our cost of electrical generation. And that's going to take renewables. It's going to take probably figuring out some. There are a couple of these old coal plants that are due for 50 and $100 million upgrades. And when, you're short, when you start putting that kind of money in and you're still burning coal, I mean, natural gas right now is cheaper. If you're starting just building a, two plants side by side from scratch, you can run a natural gas. You can build one and run it cheaper than you can with, with coal. So, that, that equation goes, goes very rapidly, and especially as you look at more wind and solar, the, the natural gas uh, electrical generation can, can go on and off, can cycle on and cycle off very efficiently with very little additional po uh, pollution, unlike coal, which every time you cycle a coal plant down, it spews particulates and all kinds of, of pollutants into the air. And then when you, when you cycle it back on, starting it up is very inefficient, very very dirty. So I, I, our goal is to see if we can really get there and have it be you know, revenue neutral. Uh, and I think we will. Other questions? Back, back, Rep. Hi. Um, first, Governor, thank you for coming to speak with us today. Um, you mentioned um, natural gas, and you mentioned some of the fugitive emissions that come from natural gas. And there's also been studies on groundwater pollution from fracking for natural gas and some other concerns. Obviously, we want to move away from coal, but are you ever concerned that as we run towards natural gas that we're maybe jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire <laughs> in terms of pollution? Um, we're, we're certainly sitting around the fire. But, but I'd prefer to look at it as a campfire. You know, um, <laughs> the, the groundwater, I mean, there are definitely some in, issues, and it's an industrial process. I, I in no way want to diminish that. Uh, done properly, and it's not hard to do properly, we only can find one. Uh, there are like 45 or 50,000 wells in Colorado that have been fracked. And our, where those fracks occur are pretty deep. And we've only found, I think, two wells where we can ever demonstrate um, uh, you 
you know, connection between where, where, where the fracking or the drilling of the well actually polluted the groundwater at the upper horizons. So that, uh, and that hasn't happened in, in many, many years. Uh, we know now how to do cement casing. Spilling frac fluid or crude oil or any of these things into streams or waters, I think that's a legitimate concern that, that we take very seriously. And I mean, we're now, you know, three years ago, if you, if you had a frac pond and it was leaking, we could, we could find you, uh, find you up to $500 a day for every day that, that we could demonstrate it was leaking. So some of these leaks would take for several months. So let's say 100 days. We could find them, 500 bucks. Well, 500 bucks times 100 days is, you know, 50,000 bucks. For a lot of these companies, that's not a big deal. So we changed that two, two and a half years ago so that now, if you're spilling into our waterway, it's $10,000 a day. And you know, what a surprise. <laughs> All those spills went down like magic. It was like one of those miracles I was talking about. So, I mean, if, if I think almost all of us, if we really, really got down and looked at where our food comes from, how, where chemicals that we use in cleaning our homes, all kinds of components of our modern lifestyle, we would be appalled at the risk of, of some of these contaminants and pollutants that are in our, in our universe. Uh, I think that we are every year making big steps towards getting better, safer food, recycling things, making sure that we don't have these carcinogenic pollutants in so many aspects of our lives. And we are getting better. But you know, I don't think oil and gas or natural gas wells, at least in Colorado, are, are at the top of the list. They're, they're certainly of significant concern. But I would much prefer to keep working on the renewables and, and, and again, dramatically increasing the, the research and development so we find whatever this ne next breakthrough is going to be. But in the meantime, take more of the coal plants and put them into natural gas real time, right? I mean, that's, to, until we get that breakthrough, that's the only thing that's real time going to dramatically change our, our emissions. And, and at the same time, measure, we're looking at new ways to measure fugitive emissions so we don't keep having escaping methane, you know, which is a terrible climate change uh, 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 pollutant. Uh, I mean, all these things, we, gotta, we are constantly looking at how to uh, measure, because you can't do anything if you don't measure, but measure the, the, the issue and then and get, uh, you know, figure out what the appropriate response and solution is. You know, when we passed the methane regulations, some of you remember, Half the oil and gas industry went nuts and said, how can you do this? Never been, no other state's done this. They went wild. It's going to cost us, and it, this was the estimate, it was 60 to $80 million a year to go and in, implement all these uh, improvements in, in the oil fields of Colorado. Well, that was two and a half, three years ago. And now they're telling me that that cost is probably down to $25 million a year, maybe $30 million a year. They think they'll get it down to 15. This is the history. I mean, seatbelts, you look at it. Everything starts out being a huge pain in the, uh, the neck. And, <laughs> and, and the industry is very, very resistant. And then as it scales, the costs come down, and we begin looking for the next innovation. So let me interject one question here on this point. What's your thought on how to approach situations where government is going to set up a regulatory framework that will catalyze innovation? Um, there's the risks there, because you don't know the innovation is going to happen until it happens. So if you don't push for it, you may not get it. But if you start pushing for it, industry is going to be you know, crying bloody murder. We can't do it. How do you figure out how to right. find your way through that? Well, you know, we, what we did with the, uh, when we did the, the fugitive emissions, uh, the methane regulations, I, I thought that, that, that taking the time in the beginning, and, and I, I, I met separately with the oil and gas folks and with the environmental groups, and I listened to what just their concerns were. I didn't say anything. I just listened. And then, <laughs> came back to them together and, and just said, all right, here's our, the way we look at it. We want to get the maximum benefit for every dollar that the industry spends to reduce methane emissions. We want to get maximum reduction of the methane. We want to use those dollars that are going to get spent as effectively as possible. That's first. Second, we want to make sure that there's no red tape. Because this is what the industry hates. They hate form after form and paperwork 
So, so we made a commitment. We will make this as simple. We'll keep it to one or two pages. Uh, but, but we want a high level of compliance and, and a commitment that the industry is really going to take this seriously, which they did. And then the third was, and this is a funny one, but we heard from talking to the two sides, we said that we'll make sure that the industry gets a shared recognition for the success of this alongside the environmental community because they felt that too often the environmental community, you know, once they make a, a major change and invest millions of dollars to solve some environmental risk, that all of a sudden the environmental group takes all the credit and, and, and the industry is the evil, you know, the, 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 the evil doers, as a former president said. Um, and the bottom line is they felt that wasn't fair. So we were very careful when we announced methane regulations that we had both sides up there claiming victory and showing what, why this was a success and why they were proud of it. And, you know, the, the great thing about that kind of a process is that once you're, once you're through the whole process, both sides are ready to go back to work and, and look at the next issue. You don't end up with all the bruises and hurt feelings and, you know, uh, bloody noses that sometimes happen when you go through a regulatory environment. Uh, it's not always easy, but, you know, I asked uh, uh, one of my staff before we began this process uh, whether they thought there was any hope that we get the, envir the environmental community to sit side by side and work together with the oil and gas industry. And this was a person who had been at work when, when Governor Ritter first put through the new oil and gas regulations, which were a dramatic change, and it, you know, the whole world blew up there for a few months. And uh, the staff, our staff person said, no way, right? They are never going to work together. They may go through the motions, but they're never going to work together. And it turns out not to be true. I think almost if you find the right, and part of it's the right people, part of it's creating the right context. But one thing government should do, whatever else you think government should or shouldn't do, one thing government should do is be the convener, the, the place that creates a safe space where people can really, you know, uh, debate and discuss complex issues and figure out compromises uh, without being held up to ridicule. Other questions? All right, uh, let's go up front here. Hi, thank you. So I think uh, all the bans and moratoriums on fracking across the city, across the state, show that the citizens of Colorado don't really feel that the, there's any protections for them, which is why they feel the need for this. And the the offensive setbacks that we have for industrial complexes that can come into neighborhoods without having to follow local land use policies and can just assault neighborhoods are just terrible. And I drive every day north and see a dirt cloud of pollution over Weld County and see that now moving into my county. And you mentioned that air quality has a toll on human life and, and human health. And the, I guess, the failure of the task force to address, really address any of these issues, you know, is concerning to citizens. And not just that, we have we have no gas capture technologies to stop the pollution, which is happening in other states. We have the lowest severance tax in the West. And I heard, the other, I heard your interview the other day on CPR say that we should raise tuition for higher ed by 10% when other states. You, you, you listen to somebody else, not me. Uh, <laughs> no, no. I'll well, they were talking about your budget. Listen and Listen a little more carefully. Yeah, we were, you were talking about the budget, me. and they were saying that higher ed might need at least a 10% tax increase. No, that's, uh, what we said was that because of the hospital provider fee issues, we could not, we could, we cut everything, and we cut $20 million off higher education, and that might lead to tuition increases. So, I mean. He also said he was very sorry to see it happening, but the structure of our fiscal <laughs> system is such that he's forced into these decisions. Um, let me, let me there, are, there are several questions there. Why don't you give the mic to Sean and let the governor try to answer some of them? Well, I think the, the real question you're asking about is why isn't the state doing more to protect the, the air and the health of communities, and especially why, in terms of the commission, I think the major issue is why are people allowed to come and drill wells close to neighborhoods? Uh, and the, the plain and simple answer is that this, this state, in our Constitution, has very, very strong protections for private property of all sorts. And we have very clear methods that if, if the community, if local government or the state or anyone wants to take your private property because they think it's a, a risk to the rest of us, 
They can't do it without making what fair co uh, compensation. So there's a, a process of condemnation that if we, if we need someone's land for, I don't know, an expansion of a, of a, of a road or uh, if we need someone's land for a, I don't know. Airport. A, an airport, <laughs> a baseball stadium. These are bad examples. But, but, but there is a whole process by which we assess what the value of that person's property is. And then we make fair compensation. And, and, a, and a, this is worked out in a court of law. Someone who owns minerals, we're, the West and most of the Western states have the same thing. We have the split estate. I was looking at previous speeches uh, in this series, and one of them was the whole speech was on the split, split estate. But we have the person who owns the mineral rights underground back in the early 1900s, that was separated from the person who owns the surface. So the people who own the mineral rights have no vote in who gets elected to town council, or have, they have no vote, no voice in terms of zoning, whatever. And every community, if they could, would zone them 10 miles away. Why, why would we want them anywhere near without regard to that, that someone had made an investment in that private property? And what I've said frequently is the states, I'm, we're happy to come and be a partner. If, if local communities really want to, to not have drilling, and let's say they want a mile buffer, let's look at what the, what the risk weighted, not just what the oil company says, but what the risk weighted value of those assets that, that are going to be taken from them and use a process of you know, something similar to condemnation and set a value on it and, and do it as a public good. But that's not what anyone wants, right? The, the public doesn't really understand that in our Constitution it says that, that this, these mineral rights are private property and therefore are protected like every other form of private property. And that's, if it, we'd have, we would have to go to the state constitution and change that. And a lot of, I would talk to Phil or, or some of the professors here, most people think if we went and banned fracking in our state constitution, somehow that passed, I can't imagine it would, but that it would be ultimately overturned in the US Supreme Court as a taking. And we would have to pay enormous uh, compensation for the lost, the lost opportunity and lost revenues that we took. So that's, that's really where it comes from. What our response has been so, and, and what the commission is trying to work towards is, is where you have uh, higher density drilling closer to where people live, trying to figure out how can we get, without taking away anyone's private property, how can we get quieter rigs? Because that does bother a lot of people, the noise. So electrical rigs are much quieter. How can we make sure that we measure more accurately that there's, so we can say that there's no natural gas escaping? Uh, how can we raise the fines and improve our, 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 our observational powers to make sure that there are no spills of any sort if you're going to be close to a, a, a place that's it's densely inhabited? Uh, how can we get, uh, instead of trucks going up and down the roads, force them to put in pipelines and, and have the collecting tanks further away uh, would cost more. But again, I think there's a legitimate argument when, when and it, but this, I think there's a legitimate argument that it sometimes gets pushed aside by, in the debate. Uh, but I would argue that, that some additional cost is, is, is fair if, if you can, if you can demonstrate clearly that there's an improvement to quality of life, or you'd have to actually improve an uh, improvement to health. I think that would be the, the necessary there. All right, we have time for one last question. I'm happy to give a faculty member or advisory council member the prerogative if anyone in that group has a question. Don't you think I almost sounded like a lawyer, that last answer? <laughs> I mean, as, just as, some, as someone who's started over 20 businesses, had over 200 investors, millions of customers a year, and I've never been in court. I've never sued anyone. No one's ever sued me. So this is like being in, in Oz to a certain extent. <laughs> so Mark Scalacci, who, um, fitting uh, for the last question, our uh, professor in the area, next to Bruce Kramer, who gave that lecture on Spirit of the States, by the way. Hey, oh, hey, good. Hey. So maybe we're going to go deeper on Spirit of the States. Get up here. Get up here. So thanks, uh, Phil, and, and thanks, Governor, for your talk. Um, you're the chief executive in our state. No, no, the, the supreme executive. What the state, <laughs> what the state, what the state so, constitution says is the supreme executive. So, so let, me, let me push you on that a little bit because I appreciated your comments about the Clean Power Plan. And my question is really only nominally about the Clean Power Plan. I guess my question is more about the structure of our government. 
And uh, even as you're speaking favorably about our ability as a state to meet the goals of the Clean Power Plan, our Attorney General has filed or joined the lawsuit challenging the Clean Power Plan. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about the importance of the state speaking with one voice on issues like this. And if it is important, what, if anything, can we do to help make that happen? That's such a nice softball. <laughs> wow. <laughs> If you're looking for a second job, we can help. <laughs> um, so I absolutely think the state should, should speak for one voice. And this is actually in the, in the eight months that, that uh, the Attorney General has been in office. She has filed, has joined three separate suits. Um, one of them was over the, the, the Bureau of Land Management put out some uh, fracking you know, regulations on hydraulic fracturing uh, and a couple of other uh, oil and gas processes on BLM land. And you know, the BLM basically took our methane regulations and used it as the template. So their new regulations were almost exactly the regulations we already had. And we were negotiating and quite close to getting an exemption for all the, all the oil and gas activity in Colorado, they would just have to do our regulations, and it was essentially the same as what the BLM said. The moment the Attorney General filed suit, the BLM said, we can't give you that. We can't continue to negotiate, because we're negotiating with your Attorney General's office. And now we can't, I mean, you've got a conflict of interest there. So all of our oil and gas people are in limbo as this thing goes to court, and, and are these rules in place, or you know, how's that going to happen? Whereas they could have had uh, predictability. The other big issue with these three times she's joined suits is her attorneys are giving advice now on, on the clean, clean Air, Clean Power Plan, plan uh, 11D. Where our people in the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of Public Health and the Environment are looking at how do we implement, how are we going to do this, how are we going to get to this, and their lawyers are helping us. At the same time, other lawyers in the Attorney General's office are figuring out how can we scuttle this and how can we torpedo it. And you know, we've had calls where I am talking to the Attorney General, and you know she's saying, "Well, we don't have a client, attorney-client privilege. So whatever you're saying, you, you have to recognize that you can't talk to me as your attorney." What? I mean, <laughs> you know, how can that be that in so many of the most important issues, I can't talk and and, and rely on the confidentiality? Of, of my attorney, of the, of the state's attorney. Uh, so anyway, we, we did file with the Supreme Court uh, uh, an interrogatory, I don't know what it is, a petition. A, a petition, uh, is it a writ of man, I don't know what the writ is, but writ of mandamus? I think so, I'm not sure. Again, <laughs> I cloak myself in a, in, a, in a veil of legal ignorance in terms of terms. Uh, <laughs> But they did bring to me the, 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 the language from the state constitution, which I never looked at. I didn't know I was allegedly the supreme executive of the, of the state of Colorado. Um, it certainly when I'm negotiating the budget with the legislature, it doesn't seem like it, <laughs> but, it's but the, <clears throat> we did file that. And, and, and the issue is not so much really whether you agree with 11D or whether you don't agree with 11D, or whether you agree with the BLM regulations or you don't agree with the, the BLM regulations. The real issue is, should there be one voice? Should the state speak at one voice? Because otherwise, sooner or later, it's going to become Colorado versus Colorado, right, in one of these court cases. And it, it just, it, it really is not in the best interest of the state. So I don't know, in terms of offering help, I, I really, sincerely hope that the, the Supreme Court will take the case and, and to whatever they decide is best, provide clarity. And, and that's all we really ask. So I'm sure many of you have friends on the Supreme Court. Please call them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a joke. I know, I know enough about the laws and the courts not to do that. Um, but it is, I, I, reading this thing, and. and in, in, in the enabling statutes, the, the Constitution says that the Attorney General shall be the lawyer for the, for the agency of the state. And in, those, uh, and in those legal cases, when directed by the governor. And so the only exception is if there's other statutes that say that the Attorney General should, could initiate something. And, uh, and there are four or five statutes 
none of them have anything to do with suing the federal government on, on any of these issues. So we look at it and we think it's pretty clear, uh, but you know, there are other things that look clear at one time too and then they, can, they get more obtuse as, as it comes out. But we just, we hope that the, the Supreme Court will take it. That, that's our biggest, and, and make sure that we have clarity so at least we know, A, that find some way where I can have, I mean, they don't, the Attorney General's office doesn't even have a firewall, right? In other words, so the lawyers are welcome to talk to each other when they're on both sides of the same issue. There's no, uh, most law firms would have a, you know, some sort of you can't send emails, you can't talk to these lawyers because they're working on the other side of a project from you in some way. Uh, we don't even have that. So how many students are here tonight? All right, so what I generally do is encourage community members to reach out and talk to the students at the reception and in honor of our first brewmaster in um, the state of Colorado, <laughs> join us for a brew next door. But first, let's thank our Supreme Executive for Supreme <laughs> Executive. <laughs>